All right, so we're back, and um, once again, here we are in the beautiful Santa Fe National Forest, and it's Henry and Feather, and we're talking more about Grandfather David and the Hopi. So, anything you want to share, Feather, go for it. Well, I'd like to share some of the fun things about, I got to spend 10 years um, visiting Grandfather David and his wife Nora in the Hotevilla and got to help out with, you know, whatever was needed. I'd, I'd stay for a week at a time and, you know, go fetch the water from the spring down below the mesa and help uh, write letters for him. And now, how often would you make the trip from New Mexico to Hotevilla? As often as I could. Um, you know, I was raising kids and sometimes working and stuff, but as often as I could, I, I would go up there. I mean, were you there like once a month or just a couple times a year? A couple times a year. I okay. mean, once, and then I still would go visit them when I lived up in Montana sometimes. No, I wouldn't. That was, that was after. And since, since he had no telephone, you would just go, right? You'd just show up? Just show up, yeah. <laughs> So when you, when you daughters had a telephone, and she lived on the outskirts of the village. So would you call ahead of time and say, I'm thinking about coming, or you just go? Just go, yeah. And, and, and how would, uh, how would uh, Grandfather David usually respond when you would show up at the door? Oh, ecstatically. He was always happy to see everyone, everyone. And he would open the door and, and you know, greet people. Sometimes there would be a lot of people at his house. People came from all over the world to, to see him, even the Dalai Lama. Really? Yeah. The Dalai Lama came to meet the Hopi elders, and they discovered that the, the Hopi word for sun was the Tibetan word for moon, and the Hopi word for moon was the Tibetan word for sun. And <laughs> Kiva, which is their underground uh, sacred cerem uh, ceremonial building that they have. There's seven different kivas in Hotevilla. Every little neighborhood has their own kiva. That the, the um, Tibetans have something similar to that. It's also called kiva. So that was really exciting and uh, there's a wonderful picture that a sister took. And I, um, <clears throat> when I moved to, to Montana, I wasn't intending to move there. I was just visiting, but then I ended up there 30 years. And during that process, I got my, my master's degree at University of Montana. I finished it in 2004. And I wrote my master's thesis and did my final presentation, which was a play at the Master Theater, it lasted a couple hours, uh, on paintings and stories of Grandfather David uh, that in, inspired by Hopi prophecy. So. That was really great. And I would go down and visit whenever I could. And in the springtime, even when I was in Montana, we, I would go down. I was also helping out at Big Mountain with the Diné. And it was the traditional Diné and Hopi were uh, worked together on a team to try and stop the relocation. And that is a whole nother, uh, very intense a situation where the U.S. government and particularly the corporations like Peabody Coal were just coming in and taking it all. And in, when 79, with the Native American Religious Freedom Act passed, I was on a couple years after that, I was uh, one of the people on one of the court cases as a, a witness. And I think it was Cactus Valley was the community and Peabody wanted to expand the mine, keep expanding the mine, and there was a very sacred spring there that was very special to them on an altar. And they were taking Peabody to court, saying that they were violating Native American Spiritual Freedom Act. And it went on and on, dragged on for quite a while. And then finally, the judge, uh, he ruled that even if the spring was destroyed by their digging and their corporation, they were not preventing them from coming to this place, even though they destroyed it. And so he considered that they were, that was what it said, that, that uh, I, and I, in the, the way it was written, that Native people would be allowed to visit their sacred places. 
but here they destroyed it. They utterly destroyed it. So uh, that's not protecting. Now the, the Dene is the Dene another tribe or a subtribe of the Hopi? Yes, it's totally another tribe. It's the Navajo. And, and are the, they also in Arizona? Oh yeah, and actually uh, they have a lot of territory that completely surrounds Hopi land. And they also had about a million acres that they they had in a, as a joint use area that they held in a joint use area in the 1800s. And then when they when uh, you know Standard Oil and Peabody Coal discovered the water, the oil, the coal, uranium, they just went in there and just started you know building all these horrible, horrible mines and polluting the air and causing you know terrible. Uh, cancers and, and misformed babies and all the stuff from the uranium mining and, and the coal and ah, it's been really. So awesome. were the Dene and the and the Hopi uh, friendly tribes? The traditional people are united. Mm -hmm. The um, the progressives maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. And then also the Hopi, the progressive Hopis that have been hired as as police officers and stuff, uh, they would go in there. You know, they would they would go over to the Diné and 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 they were. I was there one time and they were destroying a burial ground and digging a, a water water catchment for the stock. And so Roberta Blackgoat and a bunch of supporters went over there early in the morning before the sun came up, and we chained ourselves to the bulldozers. And then the workmen came to work, and we said, we're not getting off. We want to see Ivan Sidney. He was the tribal chairman back then. You know, we're not going to get now off. You personally we... chained yourself to a bulldozer. Yes, along with quite a few other people. Mm -hmm. and, and during this time, we said, you know, we said, go get Ivan Sidney and bring him out here. We're not going to stop till we talk to the tribal chairman. Well, they spent hours, and then after a while, somebody came, but he wasn't Ivan Sidney, and we wouldn't get off. And Roberta was going around and talking to the young Hopi uh, dozer operators and explaining to them that they were related. You know, the Hopi and the Diné are related, and these are your ancestors' bones here as well as ours. And you should not be doing this, destroying the earth. So she went around and she talked to all of them while we were waiting. And then eventually, he never did come, but it was it was late enough in the day that all the workers went home. And we were succeeded in keeping it from being completed that day. Uh, so, oh, another thing I want to tell you about Grandfather David. It was really fun. He would give everybody... He was an incredible sense of humor, and he loved to sing. He did a lot of singing, and he would um, give everybody nicknames. Like, when I, I had a friend named Robert Boyle, and he called him Robert Boyle and Coffee. <laughs> and another friend, uh, Bob Cuculio. That's Rainbow Atma. Huh? That was Rainbow Atma. Robert you, Kukulia was Rainbow Atma? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he was a tall, skinny brother that, that was uh, active in um, the first Arkansas gathering, 1975. Uh-huh. And he lived in Ponca, Arkansas, and New Orleans. Well, then he ended up in Hopi Land. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, yeah, so he called him um, Robert Coca-Cola. <laughs> so everybody had funny names, but actually, uh, Grandfather David gave me a Hopi name, which I thought was really. Special. And what was what was that? It's Homasa. 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 And what did that mean? That's Hopi for feather. Oh, for heaven's sake! Yeah. So. so what was what was the range of years that you were visiting him? Was it immediately after he came in 77 that you started yeah, connecting? Yeah, I think it was 78. We had a friend who was helping out up at Big Mountain, and she was at um, Catherine Smith's house. And she sent us a letter and said, you know, I've been you know, volunteering here for several months, and I, I need to get a ride and come, come back. 
to New Mexico. So we went and got her. And she was staying at Catherine Smith's house. And so I got to meet Catherine Smith back then. And that's how, from Grandfather David, that I became acquainted with her and got started helping out with Big Mountain, which was um, for the Hopi and the Diné. So um, did you always go to visit Grandfather David by yourself? Or did you ever go with, with like Jason or other people from New Mexico? Oh, yeah. Jason came a time or two for sure. Harold and Jeannie got to meet Grandfather David. Really? Yeah. I think Barry took him up there. And, um, well, there's a whole story about the Pajo and our trip down to Mexico uh, with to Teotihuacan that also involved uh, a special ceremonial Pajo that Grandfather David made to get for us to give to the Aztecs. And Sid, Washboard Sid, was the one who carried it down. And then they had a gift for the, for the Hopis. And uh, Quis Quiatl was the Aztec medicine man. And he asked uh, Washboard Sid if he would take the, the gift from the Aztecs to the Hopis back. And he says, no, I'm not going that way. I'm going to California. Let, let Feather do it, because she lives nearby. So I, I was uh, allowed to carry that gift back to Grandfather David. And it was, it was really an honor. And Quis uh, checked me out well to decide that I was worthy enough. And then he brought me into the middle and smudged me all over with, with feathers. And then he said, uh, I'm going to have to ask you some questions, and this was all through an interpreter. We were down in uh, Mexico City at the time, and he said, <clears throat> you need to, I'm going to tell you what's inside of this gift, and I'll tell you the meaning of each item, and I want you to explain that exactly to Grandfather David. He says, will you do that? And I said, yes. And he said, would you make sure that this gift goes directly from your hands to his hands. And I said, yes. And then the other thing he asked me first off was, did I know Grandfather David well? And I said, yes, yes I do. So um, what was, it was a tiny little white box, little tiny white box, like a little present box. And it was wrapped with uh, colors, ribbons from the four directions, red, yellow, black, and white. And inside of it, he told me that there was, I never opened it, uh, but he said that there was a piece of copal incense and that there was some obsidian, which was very important to them for making tools. And then also there was four kernels of corn, the color of each of the four directions, red, yellow, black, and white. And that was what was in the gift to them. And when I, I got to Hopi Land, after we got back home again, um, Jason and I went up to give him the gift, but he wasn't there. And we couldn't call ahead or anything. They don't have phones. So uh, we found out that he had gone with the hog farmers, and they were taking him to the Mayo Clinic to see if the doctors there could help him to regain some of his sight. But um, he was blinded when he was chopping wood one day, and a, a splinter of the wood flew up into his eye, and he didn't get good medical care at the time, and it eroded his um, optic nerve, so that's how he became blind, and, and they couldn't do anything to help. So, um, so we left, because I was not going to leave it there, it was going to go straight from my hands to his hands. We left and came back a few weeks later when he was home, and then I gave him the gift. And he was so excited, and he, he wanted to go right down to the kiva to show it to the other elders and to, you know, do ceremony with it as well. And my friend, uh, David Milgram, that I've mentioned, who's a, a uh, wonderful chiropractor, wonderful chiropractor and healer, just incredible, and a rainbow. For, he went to the 79 gathering. Uh, <clears throat> one time, and it, this was actually the last time I was with Grandfather David, it was in... 77 or 78 went you know right in there no 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 it couldn't have been 77 or 78 because you were 
with Grand no, Grandfather no. David for 10 years. 87. Uh, there you Excuse go. Excuse me. I yeah. got him backwards. 87, uh, almost 88, because he did pass. And they what they call it is putting on the cloud mask. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and also, uh, Grandfather David is a kikmungui. A kikmungui is a spiritual leader, and they are determined from birth and raised to be spiritual leaders. And when the... Uh, the cavalry came in and tried to steal all the kids and haul them off to boarding school. He was just a little, little boy. His parents hid him down in the kiva, and they didn't get David. So um, he got to stay at home so they could they could teach him. But then eventually she, he did have to go to the boarding school in Keems Canyon. In where? Keems Canyon, which is, you know, they take them where they couldn't go home every night. You know, that was part of it to just separate them from their family and their language and their customs and their religion. So David David did go to a boarding school when he was a young boy? Yeah. And this would have been, what, 1870s or something like that? Do you remember when he was born? Yeah, it would have been back then. Well, back he, died, he died in 1988. 88, and he was 103. So 1788, 1785 or so. Is, he probably was born about 1785. And did he ever say how old he was when they took him to the boarding school? He was he was pretty young, and he met his wife there. I mean, she was in school, and they, he and Nora were uh, together from elementary school on. Uh, and also, this is this happened too. Well, when the, uh, World War II happened, they tried to force all the Hopis into um, fighting the war. And the Hopis are peaceful, and this is this is their religion to be peaceful and loving and kind. And so, a lot of the elders were put in prison for the whole war, including Grandfather David. They had to sit in prison, and the women and the elders and the kids were the ones. Now, was this World War One or two that you're talking about? Two. Because he would have been an adult already at World War One. Maybe it was World War One. Okay, World so War One was nineteen fourteen. So if he was born in eighty five, yeah, he would have been in his twenties or thirties during World War One. Okay, that makes more sense. Maybe he was. Probably maybe was. he was in prison for both of them. That's possible too. Well, no. By World War Two, he was probably too old for military service. You know. Yeah. By World War Two, he, he grandfather David was probably. 56 year old man yeah you know i think you got it i think you got it right we can we can probably world war one um